Kyle's just grabbing us some coffee. Uh, we're super happy to be here another day hanging out. We've got a new location. This was one of the residency rooms, but uh, has been transitioned into the holding all of our stuff space. Um, it's another week of flat files. Today we're being joined by Derek Liddington and we're going to check out his studio space. I can see that he's already on here waiting for us. And uh, like always, we're gonna talk about practice. We're gonna share some artwork from our personal collections and yeah, just have a nice little casual art chat. So we're excited to get started. If you hear um, a tiny in the background, it's our puppy. Uh, we had to put him in the crate because he's kind of a maniac right now. Uh -huh. Hey! Hey! How are you? I'm good. Oh, it's is this, is it weird. Is, am I lagging? No, you're okay. It's like, for some reason, sometimes it tells me that we're going live, like on oh. the top, and I, I never know why it does that. I'm like, am I in the wrong Instagram feed? But no, I'm, I'm good. How just, are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm pretty good, yeah. yeah. I feel like I'm a little... Uh, scrambling to get done a bunch of different projects but otherwise good it's awesome. like a good problem yeah that is a good yeah. problem i think yeah I, I'm, I think I'm so. getting more and more nervous as i'm seeing people join is this a, no. is this a normal anxiousness that people feel? i think for some people it was for us when we first started so we started this like last april and uh I had, I mean, I had done some Instagram lives, but not really where, like, I am actually seen on the camera. Like, somewhere I would, like, set the camera up and draw and, like, chat at the same time as drawing, which seemed a lot more, like, I don't know, distanced from the experience. Right. And then this just made sense for being able to continue to have, like, a conversation with artists like we used to basically every single day. Uh, so I've gotten less weirded out by it, but it can be a little, a little uncomfortable, but it's very casual and everybody is very lovely and nice. And Kyle's pretty good at keeping up with like anything that pops up in the comment section. So okay. if anybody wants to like ask a question or, you know, get clarification on anything, Kyle will take care of that. So feel free to ask questions if you have them. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me know. Kyle can let me know if I if I look like like my father when he's like doing these things. Like <laughs> if it's too close to my face or if I go in and try to do something and you can see my finger, you know, just let me let's send a message. <laughs> okay, we'll keep you we'll keep you the note. Kyle's just making loop. he's making us coffee right now. We're like a little behind schedule because um of puppy. We got a puppy. Oh my god, that's and so exciting. Yeah, he's really cute. Um, but you know, he's a puppy. So he is like crying and being miserable in his crate right now because he cannot be trusted out by himself. He wants to eat literally everything. Even if it's just the floor, he'll start chewing at the ground. So yeah. puppies are mm -hmm. the worst. Yeah. They're yeah. adorable, but they're also the worst. So he's yeah. he's like upset in his crate. Hopefully he'll just fall asleep and give up on crying. Um and then, uh, and then Kyle will be here to also join the conversation. Have you met you? You've met my dog or no, Billy? Have you uh, met the Labradoodle? I, feel like I did. Yeah. She she I usually is my studio dog. Like she's usually here. Uh, but about three weeks ago, we let her on the couch for the first time. So she's six. She's never been let on the couch, and now she doesn't want to leave the couch. <laughs> so. Like, I see that my partner's on here right now, and I'm going to assume that she's on the couch with Billy, and they're both, <laughs> like, she just doesn't leave. And, I, and I, I just am reminded of how quickly any training can just, like, with one action, just, like, gone. Yeah. yeah. But she's much happier yeah. now. So I feel, I, yeah. You're like, I'm not disappointed in the decision. Our last dog was, like, such a couch dog. Like, he just was on the couch all the time. Or the bed, like he had little stairs to go up and be on our bed, um, which I'm not. We are not going to, well, I mean, who knows? We're going to try not to allow that anymore. Um, that will probably, we got a corgi and he's adorable and 
like fuzzy and so sweet, but um, we're going to, we're going to try to keep them away from the couch. There's Kyle. So how we usually do this so that I can fill you in is we usually have um, you introduce yourself and your practice Okay. And then do a little studio tour and it's pretty like informal and we can like talk about things that you're working on. Um, you know, everybody's practice is different. So every studio tour conversation is different. And uh, we're just, we like to have a casual conversation. We kind of wanted this to like model what it was like when we would have residents here and we would all yeah. be sitting around the dinner table and just talking about what was going on in the studio at that time. And then that would kind of like spill into someone asking a question, then you would go in this direction, then you would go in this direction. Um, Cause I mean, we really miss those conversations. And I think that that's something about like creating an artist community that's so lovely. Um, and then we also share art. So Kyle and I have some artworks to share. And if you brought some as well, then great. But if we're just cool. chatting about your work today, that is also great. Well I, I felt so, yeah, the artwork thing was the thing that stressed me out, I think. <laughs> why? Uh, Interesting. I, yeah, it was the thing that stressed me out. I don't know why. I think it's because, so I am very fortunate and privileged in that my partner and I collect work, and we have been since we sort of met. And so we have, like, a really lovely collection. But each, everything in it is, like, feels really sincere. And I, and I don't know if I've ever shown it outside of like where it is in the house. So I Ooh. kind of feel like it's like, it's is where it is. And, um, and I, yeah, so I felt so I was like, there was like a couple of works by like, you know, and they're all like, a lot of them are by like friends and, or, and I'm just like, I was going to take them down. And then I'm like, I feel if I take this, I have to take this. Or if I take it down, it's just weird or it's like delicate. So I brought like something that I, yeah, I brought some things to share, <laughs> but it's, awesome. I don't know if it's like art. It's like not, it's not, well, I don't know. It's like one of the, uh, something my son drew and, and, oh, it, that's and, awesome. and, and, um, I thought, yeah, why not share something like that? And then I have that's this, perfect. like, I have this little zine kind of thing collection that I keep in the studio for some reason that, and I can share some stuff from that, but it was awesome. weird. It was like, not weird. It was just like, yeah, but it, but I do miss that sharing of like exactly. stories. Yeah. Well, and we like as printmakers, and this kind of came out of a conversation with a printmaker. This um, idea, like we trade art so much, mm -hmm. and uh, we have just literal flat files filled with artwork. So it's not like everything we own is hung up in a space. And I think our space is so sort of transient in how things are hung up and taken down and changed well, around trans and also in the sense that we often pillage our framed work for frames for upcoming exhibitions right so like the you know we kind of have these like surges of we buy a whole bunch of frames and then we repurpose them and they get like sent out to galleries and then they get sold and then we lose the frames so aren't frames yeah. a funny thing like that though like Ugh. this i kind of love ikea for that like when i first started i drew to frames yeah. I, I make prints like, to I'm frames. Like, I would, yeah, I'm like, I, would, I could, like, there's a place in Toronto, I don't even know if it's around anymore, it used to be called Victor Gallery, and that's kind of where, like, all the emerging artists in town got their frames done, and I couldn't afford Victor, so I was just like, I'm like, I went to Ikea, we used to have, like, Ikea hacks for frames, so, um, I don't know what happened to my phone there, but anyways, I'm still here. Um, you still so, here. So, like, Ikea hack was that they, they did the rubberized stuff on, like, the black and white frame. Okay. But the wood frame was just wood grain because they couldn't yeah. – it was just, I guess, cheaper to have, like, just a base wood frame. So it wasn't made of MDF. And so what you would do is you would buy the Ikea wood frame and you would sand it down and then you would just spray it, like, spray paint it and stain it. And then, boom, there's your white frame. And it was – and if you bought – like a small enough size they were they had glass but you could it's way cheaper to buy glass and get a cut than it is to go to like a framing shop and get it and so there were all these hacks and i what i loved about it was that like it could also be repurposed for other things yes whereas now i buy these frames and these ridiculous things 
And, uh, and I'm like, oh, wow, that's good for that. And that's it. Like, okay. there's zero purpose for this frame. Um, I did. The Ikea frame was good enough until the point when the little metal tabbies on the back side, like, you bent yeah. them back too many times and then they would snap and you'd be like, okay, we're down to like one tab on each side. This work that's in here now <laughs> you is know, permanent work. <laughs> I have this, this horror story. I did the outdoor art show. This is, I'm dating myself because I'm, I feel, anyways, it was like maybe 16 years ago or 17 years ago. Okay. And, uh, and I did the Ikea hacks for everything. So I'm like framing all this stuff. Um, and at the outdoor art show, as you know, you take everything down. Right. And I couldn't afford it. Or at the time I couldn't afford a tent that, so there was no tent. So I took everything down and I left it in my car. And that night was a really cold night. And then it went really hot. So I guess like the humidity level and all the frames, like all of the plastic on it just popped right off. Like everything just peeled off of like the frames. And I was like, what is going on? And it was, you know, at the time it was like $600 worth of like shitty frames anyways, but I, <laughs> but it made me hate them the even frames. more. Yeah. So don't leave frames in the car. There's, if anyone just leaves this hot conversation, tip. hot tip. Yeah. I love don't it. do that. Yeah. No, it's like, I mean, I, when I worked at, um, Eno gallery, I got Carlin, the owner to write like a whole, um, blog article for our website about framing because it was just mm. constantly this hurdle, especially because, you know, I was opening a print shop. I was like, this is going to be just a barrier every single time we want to sell a print. So we talk to printmakers like framing is such a pain because I did a piece for, I got hired by Burt's Bees uh, several years ago to do like a drawing for a campaign launch and they were like, this is how much we have set aside for like hiring artists to do work for this campaign. And I was like, okay. So I did a paperwork because I wanted to stay in their budget. And then they were like, pick a framer and we'll pay for the framing. The framer costs as much as I was paid to do the art. I was like, why yeah, are you in framing? Don't even get me started <laughs> on framers. Because like, okay, if there's any framers on here, I love you. And I know it's an art form, but like. You get paid way more for your art form than I did up until a couple of years ago. Yeah. Like it is, it is literally insane. My first show with Daniel, I had these Bowie hair drawings that I made really big because I was like young and excited and <laughs> I had to get them framed. And so I went to a framer who I won't ma- name and like their cheapest frame at a discount and all this stuff was still as almost as it was like i think it was like half of what I, they were selling for the the drawings but i'm like i'm only getting half <laughs> so i'm like how does this like financially make sense and and i will say that this framer took a cheap frame okay and snapped it over he's like that's what can happen to your drawing if if you use the cheap frames i was like somebody what? can come and take i was more. like Someone's gonna take my drawing and snap it over their leg. Like, what also, are you the, talking I think about? the drawing would be fine. Like the drawing, it's more like this. Actually. Like I get conservation for packing, and I get, but like if it impedes you from enjoying a work, it's so silly. Like it, re, or from making work, like you know, like the, I think it's like it's kind of it's very it's fascinating. Anyway, it's very fascinating. Of course, I now like I have to frame for. Like, I don't frame, but, like, people frame. But I framed my own work for years. I don't know how we got on top of framing. It was my fault because I said frame. But then I, this is mine. My... Yeah. <laughs> Everyone on the chat, this is what happens if you give me a glass of wine and I talk. Like, you can just imagine the <laughs> this same is what conversations. Would happen. This I is just what would rant. happen at our house all the time. Yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah. I love it. Um, but we didn't actually introduce you. <laughs> okay. That's fine. <laughs> So, you so know, I have to like, say, oh, you wrote oh, you wrote a really nice thing about my painting, like, and then, but you quoted something, and I was like, who wrote that? That was good. And then I'm like, oh, I wrote that. <laughs> it was all the time. Because, like, right now, I'm very stressed about my work, and I'm, like, stressed on, like, I'll be talking, I'll be ranting a little bit about some things that I'm thinking through, and and often, I reconcile it, and then I just choose to forget it, so I can move on to something else. 
But then I like, if I relook at something or reread something, I'm like, oh, like I actually like knew what I was talking about there. Yeah. And I thought you wrote it. I was actually going to message you and be like, damn, that was good. And then I was like, no, wait, that's a quote. And I'm like, who's the quote from? And I'm like, oh, oh it's me. Yeah, me. <laughs> Directly from both my website and my Instagram post. Yeah, I loved I it. I was like, do I write the whole thing out or do I just pull something? So I decided to just pull up a section of it because I just thought it was so beautiful. Um, oh, thank you. So your name is Derek and you work in Toronto. Yep. Um, and are we in the studio right now? Yeah, we're in the studio. This is my my studio space. I don't know if I can I turn the I, camera I don't think we've ever seen your studio space. You well, like I we've, just we've, so this is like uh so um I'm very lucky in that I I own my place in Toronto and when we bought it 5 years ago it had this amazing garage that they had built um they built it to, like it, they were an older couple in their 90s and they built it to code as big as they could build it. <laughs> and and so they built this a, like it's like 37 feet long and it has like 11 foot ceilings but for no reason like oh. when we went to look at the house it had a bicycle in it <laughs> like it, and so i'm like looking at this i'm like oh my god it's an amazing studio so like you know we did some renos to it and stuff but then i i didn't i rented it half ass and i spent four years like just it was very messy and so recent like last summer right before the pandemic hit i had i like myself and a bunch of uh close friends of mine we like kind of renoed it a bit and so i'm very proud of it now i haven't shown it to anyone really because it's been pandemic so oh man so anyways yeah so this is kind of it oh man this, this is like is not so lovely looking... big yeah it's nice it's so... nice to see the like to feel the scale of these works because sometimes oh, that's sweet. the challenge of online Oh gosh! Yeah, I love these paintings but so much. But like the much. the ceilings, yeah. I, all I care about is the plywood. I'm like, look at this plywood. <laughs> I had I an put a nail tell anywhere me I once. Want. When I was an undergrad, I feel like everyone does this. Like I drew on plywood, right? Yeah. And then yeah. I had this amazing instructor, Rita Mako. She was like just so fierce and so honest. And she said, "You know, Derek, your drawing is not as not as strong as the wood grain." <laughs> and I'm like, God, you're so oh. right. You're oh, so that's right. a hard burn. It's so hard. But like I say to the students now all the time, I'm like, you know, if you can't outdraw the wood grain, don't bother, you know? Mm. Uh, you might like that, though. So oh, so there's the a studio. bunch of sketches on this. So are these? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I, like a sketchbook on the wall. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I give like a lecture on sketchbooks. Uh, sketchbooks don't really work for me. Uh, so I use them to draw, but I rip the pages out. And then, yeah, I often do this, and then I'll take them down. So uh, these are actually recent. I had, like, these things up before, which are, like, kind of color swatch sketches. Mm. Um, so mm -hmm. those were up in the wall up until, like, two days ago. And then I did these. I've been thinking about my nose. So I've been doing some nose sketches and 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 putting <laughs> putting them in that's my nose uh I never the, by the way never understand. look at your nose in that detail it's really <laughs> horrifying um so yeah i don't know this is the studio yeah this is like so oh, nice these paintings i've been working on i don't know if you can really see i've been working on these paintings for uh two years now i think oh that yeah. makes me feel less I mean, so, I'm still working on paintings for a lot longer than that, but it does make me feel less like, oh, no, I take too long to paint. No, take, take a long time. Usually my rule of thumb is if someone says they like it, uh, then I, I sit on it and then I ruin whatever they said they liked and then I go back into it. And then, yeah, I post on Instagram a lot more than I maybe should. Um, but what people don't know is usually if people like are like, oh, I love this, I love this, and I'm like, ugh, something's, if it's that immediately lovable, then something's like kind of not working with it. Why is uh, that? I don't know. I had a friend yesterday, so I posted, like, so I've been working on this stupid thing for uh, 50 hours, I think. It's been the last two weeks of drawing. And it originally was just supposed to be like one of these. It was supposed to be like five minutes. <laughs> but just big and then it just and then it just grew and grew so i became interested in like so i bought expensive pencil crayons 
I was gonna say, uh, are they Faber Castell? Really nice. No, they're more expensive than Faber Castell. This is how I, I don't know what? anything about materials. So this is what I do. Tell I us go about the, this. I go to the store and I say, what is your most expensive thing? And then I buy that. And I know that's a huge point of privilege, but I know zero about materials. So the only capitalism is the only way in which I can <laughs> assume something is like is has value. So I, I went, these cost me way more than I want to admit. Uh, I'll buy them what again, is, probably. Kind of, what kind of pencil crane is it? What is it? I don't even know. Polycolor? I'm not going to try to pronounce courtesies. that. Yeah. They're good, though. Man, they're good. Yeah? Yeah. They because me... I've been wanting to get pen- some, like, good pencil crayons to, like, do sketchbook working. Because I actually think that I would do better drawing in pencil crayon than, like, working with watercolor or acrylic yeah. or something like that. Well, I tell you, it takes a lot longer to work in pencil crayon. I'll give, you, I, I'll give it that. My watercolors <laughs> yeah. take me, like two hours and these bloody things take forever, but you get like, you know, I don't know. There's something interesting. I've been really interested in like layering. Yeah. So they're kind of just studies, but then anyways, the reason I'm showing you that is that a friend, I, I have a text thread of friends that I send work to. And that a friend of mine, Catherine was like, that's kind of easy. And I was like, Oh, it's like the worst fucking thing you could have said to me. <laughs> and, uh, so now I just took it back down. I'm going to destroy it and, uh, and see what I can do to it. Like oh, wow. destroy by working more into it or like, yeah, 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 yeah. So just like, I think that what I do is I like, I, I try to figure out for, as far as mark making, like my work is divided into like two, two ways of, I think, I think there's two things going on. One is like the mark making and the investigation, like kind of painting and, and, or right now it's painting, but often it's like some material quality and it's figuring out the, the tension or the balance of that and then how to push it. So that requires, I, I, at least for me, like you have to push something over the edge. And then that usually is something that like never makes it, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. like well, these paintings might be that, like these paintings were painted during a series. That series has come and gone, but I, I never really reconciled why they're working or not working. Um, and then... And then once I figure that out, then I usually work on a series with that understanding or at least that knowledge base. And then I kind of go from right. there. So that's kind of what I'm trying to work out right now. The um, pieces, the one that I showed, that form yeah. that kind of looks like a little bed or some kind like of... A fluffy like frame. Looks, yeah. What is yeah. going on? How is it, how well, is it doing that? So that, then that <laughs> Can you goes talk into about like, that? Or? Yeah. So I think that that, so that particular work, um, so we can't, that particular, let me just put this down because I talk with my hands because I'm Maltese. So that particular work came out of, um, came out of a couple of different things. Like one, I got been, I have these like obsessions that I think of and honestly, sometimes in very simple ways, but I've always been interested in like Oldenburg's kind of, uh, sculptures and, and yeah. not his like kind of maybe more well-known sculptures, but like a piece that he did called, I believe it was called the store in like 69. I'm going to guess the day. I think it was 69. I used to know it. And I studied this piece quite a bit. And it was this idea that he was like making replicas of things out of just like kind of um, like paper mache. And, and he was selling these replicas in a store in the same area that the replicas are being made. And I, I thought that that interesting kind of critique of, of capital and all these other things that are going on in the work. And, and I started seeing instead of them as replicas as like um, that, I don't know why, but there was a costume element to it. And I was doing a lot of work on theater and, and I'm a, my training is like a training. I don't know. I went to school for performance art. So okay. and that's always in my work. Uh, and so I had a, the frames came from a studio visit where I was like, I had fabric everywhere and I was like draping things and drawing them. And I started, and I'm like, I'm becoming really interested in like the canvas as a costume. And then for that work, it came out of me like wondering. So I was also looking at the same time at um, Seurat and how like a, many of Seurat's paintings he would, he had, and they've been destroyed, but for many of the paintings, but he had frames that he continued pointillism off into the frame. His, you know, he was interested in this relationship of the frame as something that subdued the image or that mm-hmm. sort of 
controlled a framing of the image. And so his kind of, or at least how I saw it was like, if the, if the painting continued on to the frame, then there was a disruption through painterliness, which makes sense for Seurat, of the frame as well as the image. Um, so I thought to myself, wouldn't it be funny if the frame was wearing a costume to look like, this is, goes back to framing, but at the yeah, sort of frame wears a costume to look like the painting. And I just thought that was kind of funny, but also made it for me a lot of sense of, of like the, or I, I kind of started, okay, yeah. So like this, like this softness. And then also it, it seemed to speak to the um, limitations of painting, which is what I liked about Seurat's gesture. Uh, Cause I'm not a painter. I don't think I'm not like, I'm an artist. <laughs> sure. And, but I don't, I'm like, I won't paint forever. Uh, I'm interested, like, I'm, I want to disrupt, I want to disrupt, I don't even know what that means. I hate, these, all these words get used by other things. I know, and then, it's I don't true. want to be a disruptor. I just, I want to, like, I want to figure out painting. Yeah. I, and not to be a great painter, I just want to figure it out. There's there's something there. There's, and there's a lot of, like, you know, my, my upcoming work is a lot about the sort of tensions within that. And, and for me, learning a lot about the tensions of the histories I'm looking at. Uh, but that frame came from that. And, um, so and then what it's moved to is like an interest in relief and sculpture. So I've, the frame got me thinking about a lot of different aspects, but at first it was this idea of like, what if the work were a costume and was trying that's, to, or, or yeah. That's fun. Uh, one of the artists that we picked today, um, I think I was kind of drawn to choosing her a little bit because of, sort of what you're saying, like, well, you'll see when I show the work, but like, um, she deals a lot with kind of draping fabric over buildings and then creating memories of those. Well, maybe we'll just show her work yeah, right I now. Feel like we'll this is a yeah. great, great time yeah. to share an artwork. Okay. Let me get my pile. So the artist I'm talking about is Charlie Young. We don't have any of Charlie's actual work. Um, because it's mostly um, like installation based or very large scale. Uh, but she stayed with us in, I think, 2013. And at the time, she had just been working on these large frottage pieces mm -hmm. where she would drape a building, usually a historic building. Um, she's done them in Halifax. This particular one is in, I think, Dawson in uh, the Dawson Yukon. City. Maybe? And, uh, and she, so she's a, I mean, she's a drawer, she's a painter, she's a printmaker, so, but these pieces are kind of more about printmaking than in anything else. That's great. So they're like a monoprint of these buildings. And so she was really interested in, you know, like looking at a building that could kind of exist in two places at once. Um, mm -hmm. And collecting memories of these spaces. So a lot of her work is about you know, collecting fragments and moments and um, pieces of a place through the action of print or drawing. The other pieces that are in here are like large drawn pieces of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, yeah. But she's done pieces in Halifax where she'll do this frottage work of buildings that it's are going to be torn down. And then the these like fabric versions of these buildings are hung in the place where the building no longer exists for a period of time. Yeah. Which I really, the, that action I find really beautiful and sort of kind of what you were saying, like taking something that's more, you know, rooted in um, like a print practice, but it sort of becomes performative. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but Charlie yeah. was uh, one of our shares. She's, I'm pretty sure she's in, Nova Scotia right now. She yeah, was teaching she That's great. Um, at NASCAD, I, I believe. Um, I have not looked at Charlie's updated resume, so I don't know exactly where she's at right now or if she's even doing work remotely like this anymore, but this is what she was doing for yeah, a period Yeah, I love of that. Well, this is circa mm -hmm. 2014. So it's very likely she's still for, working in this. For me, because like something like that is like, I find it so... What I, <sighs> You know, what I find interesting in, in that sort of practice, and, like, I think about this a lot, or a lot of my research, like, a couple of years ago, 
was on this idea of like observation and like what observation means, like in specifically in the visual arts and, and yeah. observational drawing and its relationship to say like still life where you have like Vermeer making observational drawings, but that there's this like, there's this trust in observation, but also there's this relationship of learning and listening that happens in observation. So I'm thinking a lot about the act of, um, like specifically, I think about it in terms of drawing, um, that drawing allows you to like, in a way, listen and, and be in conversation with uh, a subject and whatever that subject might be. So I love those drawings and that like, there's this conversation and in a way you're privy to the conversation in parts, like we would be privy to any conversation in parts, right? Like the, what I kind of love about artworks and this is something that I think, you know, all too often doesn't happen, but there's like something about like something that doesn't, that we don't see, right. That isn't given to us. Yeah. And, and, and then what is there isn't, isn't what, is that you know like like that kind of work for me is such a labor right and mm -hmm. so it is perform it's like performative but it's also like labor it's and a conversation is labor and and what the nuance of what happens in a conversation like this or in anything it's like that's you know that's the thing that like in a way shouldn't be distilled i don't know i'm, I'm rambling but like there's i well, think that there's something there that's like really very interesting yeah she she intentionally leaves all of her um, smudging or like any action where her physical body is like making a mark on the surface unintentionally. She those um, the large Rocky Mountain drawings are done on mylar, which I don't know if you've ever worked on mylar, mm -hmm. but it is like a, it can be a real painful surface to yeah. work on as a drawing, um, and so all of those actions of kind of like leaving a bit of yourself in the work, I think also lend really nicely to that idea of like the, that bigger conversation that's happening with like the materials and the maker and then you as the viewer being able to see those actions, but then also the piece as a whole. She also like leaves all the construction of the display exposed so you can mm. see exactly like how the piece is being um, yeah, you can see that hung. really like, yeah really evident the in, framing yeah uh, yeah that exposed frame that's i have to show mind. her work because i do a project at i uh i teach at uh, uft and i do a paper uh, a course called works on paper and, and the first project well when it's a live course i get them to do is like a frotage project of a space uh at uft which is this like sort of like um this really old sort of building with a lot of history in it that art students are so like, it's an amazing space, but a lot of my students are architect students. So I love architecture students because they're, they see things in, in a, in such a different way than I see it. And they look to resolve problems instead of seeing something not as a problem, but as like a history or space or, and so this frotage, this is great to show them because like I get them to sort of do that to a physical space and then recreate the space. And then we talk about, the differences between those two spaces. Like, so we walk through one and I'm like, okay, when we walk through this hallway, what do we see or not see? And now when we look at your work, what are we seeing and not seeing? And then what is then the potential of drawing, right? Or, or that yeah. act and all that. Yeah. Oh, I love that. We just did a, a workshop with an artist, Alvira. I'm not, I can't remember Alvira's last name, which is bad. I'll try to, I'll link to her in our stories. Um, where she sort of walked us through almost like an exquisite corpse game in a way where like we looked at um, an exhibition, which was the uh, Dark Matter Drift Project at the Agnes Etherington. And each of us was invited to respond to one of the pieces in the show, whether yeah. directly or indirectly. Then we brought that response to the workshop and we showed our response to another person in the workshop and they responded really quickly on a post-it note. I think we had like a minute to respond minute first response. to yeah. the work that we were being shown. And then that was taken further to another kind of little link up where we had to make um, like a sculptural piece out of a piece of paper. And we, I think had three minutes that time to respond to the post-it note 
So you got this like breakdown of quick responses. And we talked about like, okay, how are you, when you're forced to only have a minute, where, what, what essences of the original piece are you trying to capture? What's the most important? Is it the form? Mm -hmm. Is it how much space it occupies? Um, in the drawing or the original piece? Is it a texture? So looking at like how people consume and digest imagery and what's important and valuable to them and how one piece can be seen through all of these iterations. It was a really lovely practice. That's process. amazing. Yeah, it was super nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks lovely. for sharing that. Yeah, no, that was of great. Course. <laughs> I like I, th I think it's like really um, it's nice when you get to like collaborate on, with something virtually online and it's a great success <laughs> because sometimes it can be such a failure zoom yeah. zoom workshops can be hard <laughs> I'm I'm all of yeah yeah I'm I'm just like fully uh, online now that's all I am um, can we talk a little bit about like the mark making of these pieces behind you? Because it seems like the, the more costumey, um, fluffy pieces have a similar yeah. gesture. And yeah. then even the drawings that you have that you like the sort of overworked one that you're like going to disrupt, um, also has a similar gesture. And what yeah. is it about that mark that seems to make you repeat it so much? Yeah, that's a good, good question. <laughs> uh, it comes from my drawing, I think. Like, I'll show you. Um, so that's like a, a like a drawing that I've been working on, where it has similar marks. And then this is like another yeah. sketch drawing. So my drawing so practice, like, really comes from. And then this is a This is a more kind of complete. So a lot of these works for this specific series, or actually I guess maybe these are good to show. So this is like a this is like this drawing I oh, think is, is a so couple different. years old. But this is like iterative, a little bit of my approach to drawing. Um, like that work in particular was like an approach to drawing I would have done like eight years ago, nine years ago. And it sort of stemmed from like a lot of research actually into like Frank Stella and thinking about like um, Mark making that erases itself. So like, how do I, um, and then silhouette. So I was thinking at the time about like how you make a Mark that shows labor, but simultaneously erases its own labor through scale. Uh, or through the process of the mark being repeated. And so like I became like, uh, this is like 10 years ago, but I became obsessed with say drawing a line at the exact, so not like a heavy line and not a super light line, but drawing like a mid tone line, the same over and over again, so that you couldn't see a different, like a differing um, value range. Right. I, be, I back then I became really good at it. I'm not so good at it anymore, but it was a thing that I became like, I, I need, I need a structure, I guess, maybe. Uh, yeah, I, wish so I, I guess this it. is like why you'd be tra attracted to like George Seurat. Like the whole yeah. concept of pointillism is you just make small little tiny marks that three feet away blend together optically to form a color pattern. Totally. Cool. Yeah. And, and mechanic, like mechanize a process. Right. Which like mm -hmm. oddly enough that, that like I've started teaching an art history course, so I'm relearning art history. Uh, and oddly enough that that process was happening in like after the Renaissance as well. Like, you know uh, what, like, uh, and I become really interested in this as well. It was, it was like these processes of like mixing paint and of perspective are just, uh, are just systems. Right. And yeah. they're a system. And, and so, pointillism is just like a, it's a step towards a system at a moment in which artists were trying to in a way break from systems but also using science and color so not really breaking from a system just looking at a different system so yeah i i like systems and i and i think it gives me grounding and i find it very hard you know 
like often, so this is like something, I guess, and I, I feel so weird. I'm so talking, but anyways, whatever. Um, <laughs> when you showed, when you showed me that work, like one of the things is, is like, I, I can't just like, I, I just, I just know this about myself. I can't just make an image. Like I, ha- I don't, and, and that sounds maybe strange, but like I could, you know, even when I did rubbings, I created a process of making rubbings where I knew what I was, what I was, I wouldn't have any control over how it would look in the end. And that it was just the system of making that I had control over. And that was a form of abstracting. Yeah. But it wasn't because it, it was a, or I, my intention wasn't abstracting. My intention was actually making marks, but it led to abstracting because of the ridiculousness or like the impossibility of the, of, of that proposal. So I think the painting, I entered it in the same, with the same idea. Like my, when I first started painting, um, I was in, it was an interest in color. And I hadn't worked in color and I, and I thought, and a lot of people were drawing at the time. Like I started painting like maybe could six we, years could ago. Can we see some of your paintings? Yeah. Well, uh, we're talking about- yeah. Just give so us some like, like flybys of like, so they're like, like right now. Like, and this is how I kind of work things out. Like that's like an example of me frustrated one day. And like this talk thing talking about the soft frame. So I like usually make maquettes. This is like a, another painting my cat. So I use watercolor because uh, it dries faster in my like yes. studies. So this is like a, supposed to be a sleeping giant. Oh, it's like three dimensional. I didn't even notice that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I've been interested in relief. This is another, I like this little. This yeah, little I like there. that. It's another watercolor. But then again, it's like too pretty. So I probably like won't. It, These are studies. I, I I'm really... really relate to this pretty thing because I feel the same way about mine. I'm like, I always wanted to have like something about it that feels like, why did you put that there? Like there's like a little bit of discomfort. Yeah. But then if you, if that's, if it's phony, like I think if it's phony, yeah. like you make the discomfort, then it's uninteresting. So I have to make the discomfort almost from like over, see, I am a big over drawer. I was like, I think I like posted something like that the other day. Like I like pushing something to, uh, to a compositional edge or to a paint. Like, it's funny. Cause like one of the things I was talking to my, uh, my studio assistant the other day and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, when I work with color, I just like, I end up just using every fucking color. And that's a problem. But I think I do it because I know that that's not going to work. Like, obviously, that won't work. So then that's why I did I'm doing it. I notice that you had, like, every single one. Every of color. And every pencil out crayon is out. Table. Like, every color. But so this I'm liking. So right now I'm happy with this. So I don't know if you can really see it, but I've been practicing glazing. Oh. So this is, like, a red glaze over this, this yellow black. And I kind of really dig it. And so you kind of see it in this one, too. Yeah. Um, cool. Glazing so, is so then, lovely. And then these are like, yeah. So like, this is kind of like, these are new paintings. So again, like I, I what happen, what ends up happening is like, these are just tests mm-hmm. and none of them will probably make it to any step, but then some of them might like this one actually, like I really dig. So I'll mm-hmm. probably like, I'll, and I'll be Ooh, painting yeah. over it very soon, but I, I like, this and then actually speaking of frotage so i did this thing with one of my classes where this is actually my hand so i took watercolor paper and wet it and then put my hand underneath it and kind of like molded it around my hand and let it dry and then i gessoed it and started painting on it so it has this weird kind of broken edge so i'm interested like I've, i've been like thinking a lot about relief as this transition of painting and drawing to sculpture Right. So that's cool. where this painting comes into play, where it's like, this is a relief of a foot. I don't know if you, you probably can't even tell. No one can tell. But anyways, this is a foot. And then I did a relief of a foot, another relief. So what I did was I stretched, or not stretched. I took canvas and cut it and then glued it together to create a foot. And then this is that foot in like a pillow. So an indentation, like the negative of that foot. And then yeah. I did a negative of that again. So it's like these like doubling, like kind of like I see like almost like a bed. But this cool. is like totally a test. So anyway, so see, painting. I don't think I knew that these were so dimensional. Like 
Yeah, it's like you can maybe see it like yeah. yeah. When you step to the side, you when can you... really tell. But it's also like you know, kind of talking about like this idea of like disrupting some sort of painting norms is that looking at this as a two dimensional image on a screen, it appears really flat until you start moving. And that's when you get this sense of like the shape of it being like a relief and being exaggerated in spots. Mm -hmm. And like just the way that you handle your marks, the fact that they're very directional at times, like I think also kind of disrupts the two dimensional surface of it. Like there's a lot of like really big successes, I think, in these ones, man. I'm really excited about this. Thanks. Yeah, hopefully. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping they're successful at some, yeah. And so the mark making comes like i'm really interested in like you know the, that that moment um where i approach like like a brush stroke or a mark as uh as something that has the intention of both showing itself and creating illusion mm -hmm. right and so there is and there's a there's an there's an automatic there's like an engraved tension in that Right. Where, and like, I think Kyle, you talked about like when you step away from something like the Syrah, yeah. you see it, right? Like Syrah was showing that tension. Like how do you show its own making and not, yeah. and like, there's a, you know, for all the faults of like kind of Western art practice, and I won't even kind of go into that. There was this like sort of stubborn sincerity and mark making that existed that I'm kind of curious about. Uh, and what it did was it blinded them to all the sort of like racism and sexism and structural problems with the, the, the sort of their ways of seeing. But their obsession with mark making, I think, was like is something that I'm, I'm interested in unpacking a little bit. And like on another side, I'm like also studying what they're missing by that type of seeing. So like I'm right. I guess this work is like helping in a way this work helps me research them. Um, and I, and I, like, I'm, I'm like a, I guess that's why I said I wasn't a painter. Like I'm a, not that painters don't research because that's not true. But I, I believe that like in making, I am embarking in an act of research and understanding. And that's, and so I'm not, I'm like, I don't, I don't claim that these like are an homage. You know, I think someone, it's funny. I was like looking at an Instagram post the other day of a painting. I don't know why. And, uh, and someone says, this is a homage to, I forget who the artist was, like Syrah, or Cezanne, I think. I don't homage anyone. Like, it's a critique, maybe. It's a question yeah. Yeah. of why. And it's like trying, and like in, in a way, like that painting is the subject of the work, which is something I'm trying to work around as well. Um, I think that's so, really yeah. interesting. I feel like um, I've been like slowly trying to do a similar thing where I'm like bringing, we have so many art history books in our collection. It's like overwhelming. And so part of it is like, I have all of these resources and these materials that I don't engage with very much anymore now that I'm not in school. So I would like to continue to engage with them so that they have a reason for being in my space all of the time. Um, but also, yeah, like, wanting to investigate these people that we are perpetually talking about in different forms of study that I feel like I only have this like surface knowledge of like this very minimal amount of information about who they really were, the choices they really made, why they made those choices, etc. cetera. Um, and trying to use studio time when I'm maybe not in like the active making phase to participate in that understanding that history a bit more and being a bit more critical about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think that that's interesting because it's, it's, you know, one of the things that I, that I think happens is that we, there's a process of enjoying making. Right. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I see this when I teach too. Right. It's like, it's like students like making and I'm like, wow, well, like, it's kind of too bad, you know, like you're here to learn. Like, cause if you like something, you've learned it. You're, you're not here to unlearn because I want to teach you something else. You're here to question kind of where you learned that. Mm -hmm. And I think about that a lot. Like I, I, you know, the mark making thing, it's interesting. Cause like I, it's a fallback now for me a little bit, but it's like, I have to kind of remind myself every once in a while that it, I started that 
as a as a sort of form of not critique but understanding. Yeah. And, I, and I shouldn't lose sense of that because that's important to the painting. Like, it's not that I believe in that. I just need to understand it more. And I think that like, you know, in a lot of ways for me, I actually kind of see an end in a way to painting. Cause I, I feel like this next investigation for me is going to be one that tries to, to understand these sort of limitations and like what's, and, and I'm hoping to like write a bit more about that as well, but yeah, it's like, it's very, I always like, I always become suspect when I enjoy a process and I'm suspect when an artist enjoys something too. And I don't know why I just, but I am, I, you know, like, but I totally am. I, and I'm also, I'm suspect and simultaneously jealous, you know, <laughs> like, you know, if we're to like use this as like a, like a, like a friend conversation, what I would say over a drink would be like, I wish sometimes it was like, you know, that movie men in black where they have that thing and they can click it. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. I wish like all my art history education, like a friend, actually, I started teach, I started learning, um, or, or thinking about like, uh, like painting and color theory. So I've, I've been texting a lot of my painter friends who are much better at it than I am and asking them basically shortcuts and how I can kind of like learn quickly <laughs> this, this process. And, and one of them, uh, Michael, a good friend of mine was like, you know, as soon as you learn about color, you just hate it. He's like, I enjoy it so much. And I, and I'm like, I actually believe that I'm, I'm learning drawing a lot more lately because I'm teaching so much online. So I have to draw all the time and I'm getting better at it. I am actually like, I'm very proud of my drawing, but I don't know if I enjoy it more. I kind of liked it better when I didn't know all the rules and I didn't, and I didn't get, and I also, I didn't, I, I always knew the rules, but I liked it when I didn't know how to draw. Like, I liked that. I think I was actually maybe a better educator when I didn't know how to use and harness perspective. And now I do, and I'm really good at it. And so what do I do? I just, I just teach them perspective. And I, and I think that like art history itself kind of falls prey to this. It's why... <laughs> It yeah. seems like you have like a bit of like a theme of like you like the newness that is possible well, through and I think art the creation. research, like the, the yeah, the learning aspect yeah. and the questioning and that investigation. Yeah, and maybe never to the point of learning anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? maybe that's the key. You know, keep that. Oh key. my god. <laughs> Um, I don't want to cut us off, but we're going to be potentially cut off here soon, literally by Instagram. Although we've been giving, we're getting like a little bit longer where we don't get told to leave as fast. Can um, I share one thing before we get cut yeah. off? So yeah. this is my, I'm I want, cause I want to like, no, I just talk about myself. So this is, so this is kind of like talking about myself because my son, but anyways, I guess it's like backwards, but this, so we were in the studio and I had just bought, it says, yes, sir. Which is like a thing he says all the time. I'm sure it's from a. I was like, okay. Yeah, it's like he he always goes to me. He's like, yes, sir, and I'm like, I don't know where this is from. I'm like, it's probably inappropriate, and I I should watch what you're watching on TV. It's probably a YouTuber (laughs) YouTuber saying or something. But he's ten, so he made this. And what I love is like he does not love art, hates art, tells me he hates it all the time. But I I bought these expensive pencil crowns. And I told them, I'm like, I bought these expensive pencil crowns. They were so super expensive. So then when I was painting and I had my back to this painting, he was hanging out in the studio. He's supposed to do his homework and he drew this, but with my expensive pencil crowns and he sharpened. They really the bloody... do look so nice. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. So a 10 year old can kill it with these pencil crowns. Look at that gradient. But he sharpened one of them and it kept on breaking on him. And so it's like, oh. that's all. I'm like, do you know how expensive that pencil crayon is? Like, but I, but I kind of love it for its uh, it's so good yeah so maybe he'll be a graphic designer i don't know i just like i just like projecting what he might be in life based on david haynes says great conversation thanks man this is fantastic you're so those pencil crayons like you can tell they're good pencil crayons yeah they have like that solid coverage this is yeah my first year of university was like the difference between crayola pencil crayons and then like mid kind of like purchase or capitalism pencil crayons <laughs> and then like high-end pencil crayons and like that coverage is huge yeah oh, it's it's I, I know and i don't like I materials did. because we fall prey to them 
And I know, like, oh, I, I feel honestly the like opposite of that. I love materials. But, I love falling prey to a good material. I know, also like falling prey to crappy materials and being like, how can I right. make the most of this affordable option that I can actually have? But I think like totally. what what's what you couldn't do, like you had like some pencil crayon drawings where the marks were very layered up on one another. And like you can't do that with crappy pencil crayons. No. Like you can't draw on top of like a Crayola red with another Crayola <laughs> pencil crayon. It just does not sit because it's too waxy. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so like only because you purchased good pencil crayons can you achieve what you're achieving, which is really cool. Also, I will say that perhaps left to just a box of Crayola pencil crayons, he your son might have just done his homework because it would have been such a dissatisfying <laughs> right. experience. But these well, I'm going to be really pissed if me buying those pencil crowns is the reason that my son becomes an artist. You know, I'll be like, <laughs> come on. I, I, I paid for all that hockey. I pushed you for all these other things. And I buy one pencil crayon kit and then now you're hooked on art. Like, come on. <laughs> be like, yes, sir. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. Is that from something? Am I like missing it? I don't know. It? Probably. I, I'll ask my uh, niece. We'll yeah. reach out to our nephews and nieces and Is find Amelia? It. I'm not sure if I'm saying that name. I'm really bad at reading names. It makes me very stressed. But it says, thanks for the talk. You're so welcome. Thank you for joining. Um so we received some mail recently. We re- this is something that's getting me very excited is that like um, past residents keep sending us these beautiful things in the mail. And don't worry, everybody, I'm keeping your mailing addresses so that I can return the favor. So this um, is from Manuela. And I, Manuela's last name is German, so I'm not sure how to say this properly, but it's like Bushting or something to that effect uh, from Frankfurt. So Manuela was with us, I want to say 2014. and uh while she was here she was working on a traveling book project so she basically invited a bunch of different bookmakers to create books based on the seasons and then the exhibition went on tour so she was working on a book that was for the winter and i feel like we might have shown the book and i definitely have it somewhere but i couldn't find it and she sent in the mail the um, exhibition catalog for the project, which is just filled with the most gorgeous yeah, images amazing. of books. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times when people are here, we get to see kind of the beginnings of an idea sometimes, um, yeah. and maybe the start of something being made. But a lot of the times it's very research focused, especially if someone's traveling really far and they don't want to pack up and ship anything so that was Manuela's yeah so this is like a weird it's a weird book I guess it has like a circle which is kind of it which is like really bizarre um yeah she was playing a lot with like form like how you could push the form of an art book and it was based on a um like a fairy tale and I I think it's like I wrote down who the fairy tale is by because I knew I'd forget Um, H.C. Anderson, the Snow Queen. So that was like the um, inspiration for her particular piece. That's amazing. It's just an exhibition catalog of books, which is kind of weird. I think think like like books are just so... They're such charged objects. I love them so much. I know. Well, and I think... You know, when you hold a book, it's just like... It's such another like great example of like pushing form and changing someone's relationship to the to the art because yeah. once you can hold it and touch it and you're flipping through it and you're manipulating it and um, the, just the intimacy of it is so nice. Here we have like a weird little accordion book that has pockets. It's great, and I presume in the pockets are these folded out. Um, I don't know what what that form is called when they're like a zigzag shape. It's just accordion thing. I used to know this. I used to know book. But they're not. So is that one of the one of the things I was going to do in my master's was I was actually going to go for to school for like like book binding and and like repair like archiving in the UK. That was like because I was obsessed with bookmaking. Here, do you want to see something? Here, I'll share something. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to cut off. 
I think we'll be good for the next, like, at least another five minutes. Okay, so this is, another, this is my thing, but, like, it's so old that I don't consider it my thing. So this is, and I, I don't know how many people I've shown this to, like, probably no one. So this is a book I made by hand in undergrad. So my undergrad oh was my all gosh, about bookbinding. Yeah. And so what the pictures I in it are pictures of, so this is, God, this is going to age me, 2004. And this is back when the internet seemed fresh. And what I did was I downloaded the first picture of anyone with the, with the first, so the top 100 names in the year I was born. I typed in those names and then <laughs> downloaded their first picture and then made a book about it to kind of archive the internet. And, uh, and I, was, I became, obs- so again, systems, I became obsessed with making a book that looked like it had been manufactured, but it was like my own. So I took, took apart books and like, and made books. And I, I just like the physicality of them is like so amazing. Is it uh, like a perfect bound? Like yeah. Hard yeah, 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 yeah. So I like, you know, did the glue oh my- and all that stuff. Did you I- stitch the edge with like that nice sort of like fabric that you put on? Oh, yeah, of course I, did. I did. Called? I can't remember oh, what that's called. So that's back nice. when I had Thank you for joining yeah, us. obsessive, obsessive Derek. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I do like, I love like, there's something about books that are, that are so, that are so great. I, I had this like huge privilege of this. I was taking a group of students through the UK uh, through a project at OCAD and we got invited and I can't remember the school. It was like a big school in the UK. Like they're, I think like Chelsea School of Arts is connected to it. And uh, either London School or something. Anyways, and they had this archive. And when you say archive to me, because I'm like, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm just like, oh, archives. Uh, but they didn't tell me it was their book archive. And then they didn't tell me that it was like their art book archive. And they had all of these like Andy Warhol original books and we were allowed to touch them. And what? it's funny because my, because the students didn't like care really. Like they cared. Someone but they, saying they, I was there. Who's that? Uh, Justina Warhol. Yeah, I just seen it. Did you care? I feel like I feel like it was so hot. In that, so that's the other thing. It was so hot in that room. It was crazy hot, and I'm sweating. And I was so scared I was going to sweat on these books, but I couldn't stop touching. Them. I wanted to stay there the whole day. I just wanted to touch these books. Did she say she was bored? Um, I don't think so. So she's there. She's laughing and saying hi. But, uh, <laughs> so I don't think she was bored at all. I okay, mean, good. Clearly but she... I loved that. And, so what I, and I often think about that, that time in that those books had something that were like, that just like a presence that was physical. That connected, yeah. like, yeah. you know, it connected to my understanding of them and it connected to how I read them and all these different things. But there was something like so, like so tactile about them and like oh it was just so good what was that what's the we, artist's name we did like the 27 gas gasoline stations like i gotta touch that book like in a like a copy of that book it was just incredible cool. is, yeah i know well, we were talking with uh, our friend andrew McLuhan a couple of weeks ago on uh like another episode of flat files and his grandfather is marshall McLuhan, and so he has all of this McLuhan collection and all, just like a library of his books and his things and all that kind of stuff. And we were talking about how like Marshall and Andrew's father would write in the margins of all these books. And he works now in the space where all this stuff is stored. And he's like, I can just feel their presence the around the me all the time. Like, yeah. Um, and I think that books do kind of hold this, like, I don't know. There's just something interesting about what they can um, the feelings that they can emit, even though they're these like, you know, non animated objects. We did a project not too long ago with the rare books library at Queens. Um, Cause we had done a show about um, ex Libris prints. So creating ex Libris prints that would, you know, historically go into um, each of the books within your library, if you were like someone of status who could afford to hire an engraver mm. to create you a special book plate to put into your... So it says this book belongs to Kyle. <laughs> yeah. And so it's we amazing. did a show where like a bunch of printmakers were invited to create their own personalized Ex Libris. And then we installed the show at the Rare Books Library at Queen's. 
And when we were there setting up the installation, um, the librarian there was like, do you want to come and see some original Ex Libris plates in like old books that we Mm -hmm. store in like a separate, like, you know, whatever humidity controlled (laughs) box. And we were like, yeah, yeah, we do. And so we got to put on these little gloves and like go through these books that are just like hundreds of years old with these beautiful engravings like I'd never like seen Like illuminated before. manuscripts. I like love just, it. Like just oh my gosh, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah it felt I, like such a treat. Yeah, the older I get, the, the mm-hmm. and, and, and like, I, like the hard thing for me, and I'm sure you two feel this the same, it's like, I'm also very wary, I got, you know, to go back to my sort of like suspectness, like, come on, I, I understand that I'm falling prey to nostalgia and to fetishism <laughs> and to, you know, I get it, you know, but like yeah. there is something and I, and I'm like fascinated by that whole process of like how we put value to things. You know, because if you would have found those plates and not known their age, you wouldn't have like, you know what I mean? Like, isn't that like fascinating? Like if you don't know. And so we depend so much on, on like, we depend so much on storytelling or narrative to allow us to, to understand framework of things. Right. Like I collect old steering wheels on cars. Like I love them. And (laughs) the, you know, you can't, you can't physically tell the difference there's uh, like there's no difference but mm-hmm. if i if but when i know that it's in like a 1968 steering wheel then that means something to me even though by all means it looks identical to a 1993 steering wheel that also <laughs> is old but like but i you know so so but i understand the the like for me there's this like sort of strange tension in it and i actually like that's why i'm interested in it like my ridiculous connection to to these objects or to objects to artwork Mm -hmm. as well you know like can i i often think about this it's like and i think i can maybe but like can i tell if something is interesting if i'm not told it is like Mm. or what allows me to see something as something is it is it subjective like you know is that like that sort of like university level critique of the professor true and also, right. what, is yeah, it, what yeah, do yeah. those truths have to mean in relationship to then things like institutionalized racism or things like where if I'm embedded in a system that already is biased, which I am, then how, then how can I like, how do I look? Like, that's like really like, you know, to get too philosophical and deep, it's, I've, I haven't had a bottle of wine, but that usually comes up after a bottle of wine <laughs> is, is like, that's that's really why I make art is like to try to understand how I how I see like it's like yeah. you know um, you know to understand how I think through something or understand like how because you think through things all the time in daily life like you know yeah. what I mean like and that's informed by so many different so many things so many social constructs or social contracts and so many ways of being and then and and for me like art's just a way of trying to navigate. And understand that and be Mm -hmm. aware of it. And explore it. Yeah. And explore it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I think that's like a beautiful way for us to end this wonderful conversation. I think like that's such a, I, I feel that too with like what, when we're making work and sometimes it's like looking at different ways to find excitement and interest in something and and playing down that path and then other times it's like opening that up to a much bigger um scope of viewing and looking just like you said at like do i like this because i like it and it is worth liking or do i like this because something in my mind tells me that i should yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. for sure thanks for yeah that's a nice summary of my rambling (laughs) <laughs> thank you both so much for having so, me though so it's so wonderful. nice to see you it's nice chatting with you oh both do gosh. such amazing things so same i hope that we'll be able to see each other again sometime in real life yes um, and we miss being in the city you know at least a couple times a year we haven't left this building really um nope. in a long <laughs> time other than to get the puppy we drove like basically north of kingston 15 minutes to get a puppy and it was like 
what an adventure. We'll do anything for a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> what are, are, do you guys have like a timeline for when you're going to open back up or not yet? No, eh? we yeah. don't. No. We put the residency on pause when COVID yeah. hit and we canceled any future bookings and well, yeah. a year and three days or whatever later, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. And so and now just making, just pumping time. out NFTs in really, yeah. you know. I feel like I've already missed the boat with NFTs. I feel like I'm already like too late to that party to even get into that party. <laughs> yeah. Oh I won't gosh. get into that. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Well. yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a follow up chat where we just talk about that. Just talk about NFTs. Yeah. Yeah. Because I just saw one of the artists that I like follow, right? Like I almost destroyed the planet with my NFT and I'm like, that's clickable. What does that even mean? Yeah. Yeah. So oh, what does David Hayden say? With adaptations and objects, great talk. Thanks for sharing. Thanks so much for Thanks, coming. David. I really appreciate everybody being here and yeah. joining in the chat. And we will be back next week. Who do we have next week? Um, I can't read that. Oh, it is going to be Firecracker Press. Oh, nice. That's going to be really great. Yeah, print, print shop in the in the states doing um, amazing letterpress work. Mm -hmm. So cool. Sweet. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thanks for those who attended. I hope that was legible. This was a great talk. <laughs> I really enjoyed this. Thanks so much for having, like, hanging out with us on a Friday. Oh, afternoon. thanks, guys. It was really nice. All right. Okay. Talk to Bye. You soon. Bye. Thank you, Derek, for giving us this wonderful studio visit. I am impressed with the kind of work that you make and that grappling that you challenge yourself when you are creating a work and you bring it to this point that people like it and you tear it down in order to create something actually genuinely new. If you would like to continue to support us and you think what we do is awesome, you can do a couple simple things for me. You could like this video, you could subscribe to our channel, and if you'd like to see us make more of these things, please consider becoming a patron. Thank you to our patrons. You all are fantastic and amazing people. And it is because of you, Chrissy and I get to continue to make these wonderful videos that bring together our artistic community. If you would like to see Flat Files live, you can go to Instagram and you can catch us there every week, Fridays at noon, Eastern Standard Time.